and welcome to our Highlights Edition with the best picks of the week. I'm your host, Megan Lee, and here's a look at what's coming up. Light and supple aerial dancer Katarina Soldatu performs in breathtaking settings. Patterns and colors, the latest trends in spring fashion are out. Memorable and unique. At 75, architect Mario Botta's designs are still impressive. When it comes to extreme sports, perhaps skydiving or freestyle skiing come to mind, but acrobatics can also fit into this category, especially when Katarina Soldatu from Greece does it. Now, this aerial dancer takes her skills to newer and higher heights every time she goes out to perform. Now, for her, there is no need for a circus venue when a bridge, crane, or high wire across a valley will do the trick. Aerial dance. Greek aerial acrobat Katarina Soldatu performs her choreographed pieces at dizzying heights and with spectacular backdrops. Dance is a wonderful way of expressing your emotions. So imagine aerial dancing, like awesome, you're free, you dance in the air, it's magic. She records the magic in elaborate video clips and posts them on her website, Greece Has Soul. It's devoted to promoting the beauty and history of Greece. And for that, she has suspended her 16 meter long silk in places like the Corinth Canal. The cliffs of Mateora and the island of Santorini. The idea of staging her aerial tricks outdoors came to her by chance. While I was on vacation with a sailing boat, I decided that it would be nice to try to do some aerial silks, some aerial dance from the sailing boat. So that was the first thing I did, the first thing I tried something outdoors with my silks. Katarina Soldatu studied modern dance. Now she combines it with acrobatics. In 2013, her dance school, Beyond Aerial, opened at the Olympic Aquatic Center in Athens. While swimmers plow through the water below, she gives lessons beneath the roof. And every day, she rehearses her routines here. But there's one thing she can't prepare for inside. If you're indoors, you have like, uh, you have no weather condition. If you're out, uh, outdoors uh, on a bridge, hanging from a bridge or a gorge or I don't know, the difficult thing is uh, that you have to be in control of many, many things. It can sometimes be dangerous. Together with her team of six professional climbers and camera operators, Katerina searches for the perfect locations. Each performance is precisely planned for weeks, even months. Extreme athlete Spiros Barrios is responsible for making the videos. Well, there have been uh, times that it was quite challenging, not from uh, the aspect of filming, but uh, you, you have uh, as well to help Katarina and uh, the teamwork. We always collaborate and uh, help each other with uh, the rigging process. One of the most spectacular endeavors took place in 2017 over the Vikos Gorge in northern Greece. Plunging as much as 1,000 meters down, it's one of the deepest canyons in the world. Just as Katarina had got into position, she was surprised by a strong wind. It was like the silks all the way up, 16 meter silks, it's a difficult situation because they're heavy and they're strong and I felt that my legs are going to come off. She managed not to panic. She regained control of the silk and her team helped pull her back to the cliff. For Katarina Soldatu and her team, the Greece Has Soul project is a labor of love. It's not supported by sponsors or tourism boards, at least not yet. But the stunning stunts have attracted international attention, 
and Katerina has a long list of must-see places in Greece where she'd like to perform. I would love to go to the highest point in Greece, which is the Olympus Mountain. Uh, I would also really enjoy going to Crete and to Samothraki. So she intends to continue her aerial dancing, an atmospheric way of raising awareness of Greece's history and natural beauty. Made in Italy is a trusted phrase in fashion, food, and home decoration. And perhaps because of the Made in Italy label, customers may be more willing to pay a bit more for a funky lighting fixture with a monkey attached to it or lamps made in the shape of gold bananas. Well, the Italian company Saletti has specialized in playful home furnishing since the 1960s. It may not be to everyone's taste, but there is no denying the creativity behind the ideas. We visited the company's creative director to see how Saletti products reflect today's culture and lifestyle. The sofa is the bun, the roll is a hot dog. The cushions are tomato and cucumber slices. Stefano Saletti loves little provocations. Fast food furniture and animal lamps made his company's name. His objects are bright, loud and garish, but then he doesn't take himself all that seriously. He and his wife Adriana like to decorate their own home with products from Stefano's company. I love my work, so I also love all the things we make. They're my passion. I like surrounding myself with them. When a new rug or plate is finished, I can hardly wait to try it out at home. Stefano Saletti lives in this farmhouse in the countryside of the Po Basin near Parma. He bought it 20 years ago and has decorated it in his personal style. The living room's centerpiece is the Saletti phone rug. But not everything here is from his company. I like to mix things, like this sofa by Moroso, with our own photo print pillows. Something of one color combined with these strong images. I like these so-called mistakes and the not-so-perfect combination. Not far from his home is the company headquarters with a large showroom for iconic Saletti designs. The hot dog sofa and the burger chair. The banana lamp, originally an expensive art object cast in bronze, is now made of synthetic resin and retails for 229 euros. The best seller is the monkey lamp, designed by Italian artist Marc Antonio. It's an object with a personality. It keeps us company and it's decorative. It makes us smile and expresses our desire for joy and being carefree. The Saletti company's beginnings were a bit more humble. Stefano's father, Romano, began importing basic housewares from China in the 1960s. Stefano joined the family business after finishing high school and quickly developed his own ideas. He wanted to replace the housewares with amusing and unusual decorative objects. Nearly all of it is still made in China, though. Now 47 years old, Stefano doesn't create the designs himself, but works closely with various professional designers and artists. This duvet cover features dollar bills with his face on them, an idea from his friend Maurizio Catalan. The Sending Animals cabinet offers storage space and is a tribute to the one-time farmhouse as is the plastic tablecloth in the kitchen, another design by Catalan. Saletti knows there's a thin line between art and kitchen. 
I think we're good at not drifting over into excessive kitsch. We manage to stay on that thin borderline. The monkey lamp, for instance, has been copied countless times, but none of the knockoffs has the artistic touch of our lamps. You can see right away that they're knockoffs. They look like gadgets. This conservatory with open fireplace and comfy sofas strewn with Saletti pillows is the only addition he made to the old farmhouse. Sometimes Stefano Saletti can't find any space for a new collector's item. So it gets stored here in the laundry room, his own personal cabinet of curiosities. The weather is still wintry here in Europe, but the shop windows are already filled with the latest designs for a warmer season. We met up with a fashion expert to find out what's in for spring, and if you're lucky, it may already be sitting in your closet. Spring 2018 is going to be wild. Every rule can be broken, especially when it comes to combining patterns. Fashion journalist Silke Bücker has been in the business for 12 years. With the help of a model in Dusseldorf's fashion clinic shop, she explains what to expect from the designer's spring and summer collections. A major focus in fashion right now is actually daring to break rules, combining what seems uncombinable. You can do that really nicely with materials and patterns. In this case, an abstract floral print is combined with stripes, and the stripes are picked up again on the shoes, while the floral motif shows up again on the pants. Another trend, wearing many layers one on top of the other, ideally oversized. You have to be a little careful about the silhouette so that it looks good as a whole. The blouse can't be too long, the sweater shouldn't be too short. You have to achieve a certain harmony. In terms of color palette, the spring collection could hardly be more fresh. Almost all designers are favoring delicate tones that can be easily combined. On the one hand, you've got the pastels, the very powdery tones, but on the other, you have super glaring colors to set against those tones. What's new is that these glaring colors can now also be worn together. Ten years ago, the complementary colors, like purple and orange, couldn't be combined. Now they can. The louder, the crazier, the better. That's a motif we're seeing on runways. And another trend that was long scoffed at is making a comeback, double denim. Right now, almost anything goes when wearing denim on denim. Across all the silhouettes, you see pieces of denim that can be combined, even of different washes, dark with light. Right now, we're also seeing a lot of denim patchwork. Here, different pieces are put together to make one pair of trousers. And the 90s are back. Expect leotards and bathing suits with high-cut legs. So, feel free to go out in a shiny tracksuit. You can spot this trend in shop windows of stores like Milian in Dusseldorf city center. Here, the designer clothes on sale are pretty daring. The 90s influence is apparent in the transparent synthetic fabrics and flip-flops. We owe the experimentation with logos to the trend of the 1990s. Now they're being used on a grand scale. They aren't hiding them anymore, but boldly putting them right out there. And we're taking it more for granted. Not in a showy way, but more self-confidently. Spring is also bringing something for those who prefer design classics. The trench coat is back. The 100-year-old classic is getting a makeover. The trench coat is a classic, and now they've reinterpreted it with far more volume, so that's the new styling idea. But a trench coat is always a good investment. It's one of my favorite pieces of clothing. You should always have one in your closet. 
Next to trench coats, you'll also be seeing these transparent raincoats. And at the very least, those will keep you dry and fashionable this spring in Europe. Swiss architect Mario Botta's style is marked by geometric lines, light, and shadows. Now, most of his signature works are located in his native Switzerland, among them churches and chapels. Well, the star architect will soon be marking a milestone birthday. So for the occasion, the Casa Rusca Museum in Locarno is hosting an exhibition on his works. Believe it or not, this is a church, the Chapel of Santa Maria degli Angeli in Ticino. The architect is Mario Botta. A 65-meter viaduct leads to the Round Chapel, a building that resembles an ancient amphitheater. Just as unusual is the Church of San Volto in Turin, Italy, and the Chapel of Evry near Paris. An overview of Botta's designs is currently on exhibit in Locarno, Switzerland. The architecture itself speaks to us through its silence, and the sacred spaces of silence have a very expressive power. They embody the idea of gravity, the idea of light, the idea of transition, and these are the very principles of architecture. This is how we normally imagine churches, the Madonna del Sasso in Locarno. In Botta's home city of Ticino, sacred symbols are everywhere. The same goes for the Valle Maggia, north of Lake Maggiore. But in the mountain village of Monio, Mario Botta changed the landscape in the 90s. An avalanche had buried the town in 1986. Botta designed a church of remembrance called the Chapel of San Giovanni Battista. Architect Giovanni Luigi Dazio was site manager then. We owe a lot to Mario Botta because he has enriched this poor area with this project. This has become not only a landmark but also an expression of willpower, generosity and passion. The church has a decorative chessboard pattern and is a site for visitors from far beyond the region. The marble and granite came from nearby Peccia Valley. Architecture is always in dialogue with the landscape, with the surroundings. Architecture is never auto-referential, like a sculpture. It belongs to the geographical location, as well as to the culture and history of the place. With light sails like half domes, he created a wellness oasis in Erosa, Switzerland. The mountain restaurant Fiora di Pietra, or Stone Flower, was opened in 2017 on Monte Generoso in Switzerland. The facade with its seven towers was boldly built on a slope. But he has also left his mark on cities, as here with the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco. Switching between secular and sacred buildings is not a problem for the architect. He sees himself as a mediator. Another example is the construction of the Chimbalista Synagogue in Tel Aviv, which opened in 1998. It's interesting because it's a university campus intended for lay and religious students. The laity were afraid that the faithful were dominant. So I designed two big rooms. A synagogue to pray in and the conference room as a place for discussion.
Today, Mario Botta is working on more sacred buildings, including a mosque in China on the border with Mongolia and a Christian church in South Korea near Seoul. Always allow me to work. It's good to work. It's a privilege, especially in this time of globalization, to participate in projects so that people can express their spiritual needs. At 75, Mario Botta is far from putting his design plans to rest. Next up, an artist who has an incredible memory and eye for detail. Now, many artists set up their easels in front of the senior, scenery that they're about to paint, and they spend hours studying the landscape. But Stephen Wilshire works in a different way. He only needs one look from a high vantage point in order to draw something completely from memory. And for him, it's skylines. Well, we traveled to London to see how he does it. Detailed and intriguing images of cityscapes from around the world have made Stephen Wiltshire famous internationally. A selection of his work is on sale at his London gallery. A drawing by Stephen Wilczek can cost anything between 1,700 and 200,000 euros. I'm really satisfied for my my work because I will like the way I'm gonna, gonna do it. I'm gonna do it um, my way. Stephen Wilczek is a born and bred Londoner, and the city is a constant source of inspiration to him. He sometimes takes photos of views that speak to him, but he draws and paints from memory. It's just so beautiful out there, because I can see the, uh, the London Eye, and I see the, um, the half of that county hall, and uh, Hungerford footbridge, and a uh, bit of a uh, medieval Royal Festival Hall. Back in his studio, with the views still fresh in his mind, Stephen Wilcher begins drawing Westminster Bridge. I love doing some work and then I memorize it because um, it gives me a hard work and love my job. Sometimes I do some quick sketch of it and uh, much for very natural, but not just going to be detailed this time because very bit of a quickie sketch. A quickie sketch that is astonishingly detailed. A true-to-life snapshot of the world as the artist sees it. I think it's important stuff. Important stuff it means is it means we have to concentrate and and, um, and realize and to memorize it and by um, my mind. Stephen Wiltshire was diagnosed with autism when he was three. He began drawing when he was five. His talent was immediately obvious. He won a series of art competitions, went on to graduate from art school, and is now a celebrated artist and draftsman with an international reputation. I think I might get better doing a drawing if I like it to do, to, to do it. I must um, do the best and I'll never stop. Stephen Wiltshire often takes helicopter trips over cities, storing what he sees in his memory and later recreating the view in the form of gigantic panoramas. Here in Mexico City, he spent several days on a panorama of the city, working in full view of the public. Around 100,000 people came to watch. Meanwhile, he's worked all over the world. Uh, like uh, New York is my best, uh, my best place and uh, about many times, or about eight times, I think. And I've been to um, Dubai, Singapore, Hong Kong, and I've been to um, Tokyo. And some um, plenty, lots of places in there, and, and do some panoramas. 
This summer, Stephen Wiltshire will be visiting Los Angeles, one more city to cross off his list. With that, we wrap up another week of Euromax. Don't forget to friend us on Facebook or check out our website for more on the program. As always, thanks for tuning in, and we will see you again soon.